This is your daily dose of all things royal. Welcome back, my gorgeous, good-looking friends. I know I've been away for a couple days. I've been heads down doing a lot of researching as well as processing all the information that has been coming out between Boozy and the bots, the Sussex squad, and then... Lady Colin Campbell's new book drop of the expanded edition of Meghan and Harry, The Real Story. I'm currently still reading this book, and I am purposely taking my time with it because I'm loving every minute of it. Lady C is saying all the things that all of us have been wanting to say, and now it's out there, and she really gives it to this couple. Initially, when I read the first book, I thought, You know, she was being a little bit light on the couple. I mean, all of us had saw what they had been doing, but she really did give this couple the benefit of the doubt. Fast forward now, and here we are, and Lady C does not hold back. And what I want to do in this video is just give you a small snapshot with the epilogue that she writes at the end of the book and show you something that I feel is really important to talk about, and it's why I decided to create this video. So sit back, get comfortable. We're just going to go through just a small portion of the epilogue. This whole entire book is so well written, and I recommend that you check it out. But in any case, I hope you enjoy. In the four years since the first edition of this book was published on June 25th, 2020, Meghan and Harry's real story has clarified itself, unfortunately, not as the celebration of the positive change that thrusting and progressive individuals can achieve as they set about making the world a better place, but as the sad and dreadful warning of what happens when spoiled, spiteful, bitter, and immature people position themselves as victims despite being nothing but perpetrators whose lack of appreciation for their good fortune results in them pretending that their tremendous privileges and overwhelming good fortune are walls of misfortune, which must be smashed to smithereens, irrespective of the damage they do to the interests of others around them. Reveals not only such damaging possibilities to the well-being of the world, but plainly shows that more grounded and responsible individuals would have been counting their blessings rather than bleeding about how they don't have everything despite having too much, and certainly more than all but the most overprivileged 0.0001% of the world's population possess. Their complaints have been politically destabilizing and reputationally damaging to political structures which underpin the stability of the oldest parliamentary democracy in the world. Chief on Harry and Meghan's list has been their gripe about racism within the royal family. There can be no doubt that the identities of both the King and the Princess of Wales revealed so sneakily in the Dutch edition of Endgame emanated from one or both of them with the specific objective of damaging the reputations of both, while there was the inevitable concomitant of spreading racial divisiveness. Neither Harry nor Meghan has to date revealed what the supposedly injurious racist comment was, notwithstanding that this one comment alluded to by Harry has since grown into several comments uttered not only on one occasion by one person, as he had claimed originally, but a plethora of comments uttered by at least two people on many occasions. They have allowed the slurs to do maximum damage while hiding behind vague and unspecified claims which conflict with their own accounts, suggesting that one or both of them have been lying and that one of them is or both of them are continuing to lie. This is not only irresponsibility of the highest order, but inexcusably damaging behavior which, in my view, is nothing short of unscrupulous. As a Jamaican who values racial harmony and finds all attempts to undermine it inexcusable, I find such conduct not only corrupt, but also reprehensible, indefensible, and consequently unacceptable. Had there been even unconscious bias, as Harry has claimed, surely the only positive and responsible way in which the couple, Megan, should have proceeded would have been to address it privately. Had they had the interests of positive race relations in mind, not to mention the duty of care all families owe to each other, 
which extends to protecting against exposure the failings of its members, as opposed to exposing those failings, which inevitably constitutes betrayal and disloyalty, they would have understood that publicly acknowledging the existence of such negativity would have been damaging to everyone, not only within the family itself, but outside, to the larger family of nations, which is the Commonwealth. They had an obligation in the interests of the welfare of all to have kept any such issues well away from public view. If such unconscious sentiments had existed at all, the positive mode of conduct had to have been to address them privately and to keep them private. The very issue of public exposure should have had resonance with Harry and Meghan in that they were displeased with the royal family for failing to bat away on their behalf the speculation, which Meghan's own conduct had aroused, of whether she was actually pregnant with Archie. They seem to have ignored the important differences that existed between the two situations and would appear to have used the royal family's refusal to go to bat for them against the press as justification for breaching faith so publicly. Among the many differences was the fact that the royal family had not even been aware of the underlying issues motivating Harry to demand of his father that he assist the couple in muzzling the press following what had gone down at Birkenhead. Even if they had been privy to what had occurred, something which they remained ignorant of at that juncture, they would still have been under no obligation to assist in the destruction of a free press, for the royal family has an obligation to protect the democratic institutions of the state. It cannot justifiably seek to undermine one of the state's chief organs protecting the liberties of its citizens just so no questions could be asked about the performance of Megan's baby bump? Moreover, the performance of the said baby bump had been a matter for which Megan and Megan alone was accountable. It was not a private utterance, but a display which had taken place in public, in full view of the assembled press corps, and therefore could not be confused with something that even the couple confessed was a private matter taking place behind closed doors in the privacy of a family's intimate exchanges. The two situations were anything but analogous and off their own accounts of the circumstances in which the claimed comment took place. Harry and Meghan had an obligation to respect such secrets as existed within the family, as long as those secrets would not be detrimental to the welfare of the public. Revelation would be a trail of their duty as members of the family, and since the revelations would undoubtedly be damaging, a fact Megan herself confirmed to Oprah when she asserted that she would never reveal the identity of the culprit as it would be too damaging. Publicly revealing what had occurred would also be damaging to the public. So the couple was betraying the interests of both their family and the public at the same time. Under no circumstances could exposing racist tendencies, whether they were consciously or unconsciously held, be in the interests of the royal family or the greater good of the British nation or the Commonwealth. Therefore, any such justification as they might have believed they could further would fail on purely ethical grounds alone. There is also the ethical aspect surrounding all unconscious biases. These are not elective. If they were conscious, responsibility for them would lie with the holder. But when they are unconscious, they are patently not conscious and therefore not elective. This makes Harry and Meghan's accusations even less justifiable. They have never furnished one specific instance upon which anyone in the family accused of unconscious bias actually performed in a racially prejudicial way to them. They can't come up with examples because not one exists, a royal told me. They made their accusations to gin themselves up. Megan has shown herself to be the ultimate opportunist, reckless of the negative consequences of any action as long as it possessed the potential to increase her hunger for more fame, fortune, admiration, and approbation, even when such conduct would damage the interests of others. Meanwhile, Harry has to date demonstrated a chilling willingness to follow in her wake. It has been astonishing that Harry could have allowed the grandmother he professed to love to go to her grave believing that her formerly beloved grandson stood by the racist slurs he and his wife had made during the Oprah Winfrey interview. 
and which he would then retract following her death when he made the stunning denial to Tom Bradby that Megan had made the racist allegations and that it was the press that was to blame. The fact he would remain silent when they were repeated and even more damagingly particularized in Endgame shows a level of inconsistency allied to the degree of opportunism akin to that displayed by his wife. At the time of writing, Harry and Meghan have failed to disassociate themselves from the race-baiting of their propagandists. On a daily basis, these are led by the odious Sussex squad, who have violently and consistently attacked the king, Queen Camilla, Prince William, and the Princess of Wales over a period of years, even proposing physical violence against them. They, and the propagandist-in-chief, Omid Scobie, have deployed the race card in the starkest ways. In that, they have followed the lead of the couple themselves who, when the Oprah Winfrey interview was being aired, were quick to demand that the BBC and other television organs should not allow any middle-aged white men to comment. Since when were age and race disqualifications from making both perceived and valid observations? Is that not in itself racist as well as ageist? Nor did Meghan hesitate to utilize her royal privilege and instill censorship unfairly, for within hours of ITV airing the interview, which contained more than a handful of lies, she was complaining to Dame Carolyn McCall, the CEO of ITV, when Piers Morgan said he did not believe a word out of her mouth. This resulted in his being constructively and unfairly dismissed. Nor was the fallout limited to the United Kingdom. When Sharon Osbourne in the United States defended Piers against unjust accusations of racism, she too was dismissed, demonstrating to what extent Meghan was able to abuse her position, so divisiveness, throw her weight around, and exact punishment against pundits who deserve rewards for having called her out for a gross and unwarranted abuse of both her position and the innocents who had fallen foul of her quest for gratuitous victimhood. Okay, so I'm going to stop right here with the epilogue. Building upon this, I want to go back to chapter 9 and read this one section in which it summarizes everything that I have been stating around what this couple have been doing here in the United States in relation to running this Archwell Public Fugazi charity. So pointing out this section, it says, The Archwell Foundation is technically a combination of a nonprofit and a profit-making commercial enterprise. Its mixed status gives it a degree of latitude which a pure nonprofit would not enjoy. Nonprofits in the U.S. are technically privately funded charities to which the public does not have access to make donations. They are strictly forbidden from engaging in political activities or activism, which Archwell plainly does. Its activities are therefore an obvious breach of the law. The flexibility that its mixed status allows should not include the breaches to which it actually admits in its mission statement, being a foundation whose declared aim is to alter the media in ways that Harry and Meghan deem fit. So in this section, Lady C is not incorrect in explaining how foundations technically work. However, Archwell is not classified in the IRS tax code as a foundation. It is classified as a public charity in which a requirement is that a certain percentage of their revenue must come from the public, which it's public funds that are coming through. So even though right now Archwell is showing that they're not accepting any kind of donations, whether it be from fundraising or from sourcing elsewhere, they have to show on their IRS tax return that a certain percentage, above 10 percent, up to 33 and a half percent, Either is coming from the public or it's coming from the government. Now, what did I tell you in the last couple of videos that I've done? Meghan and Harry most likely are getting money from the U.S. government because they're not showing anywhere that there's a certain amount of money coming from the public in donations, nor do they have anything on their website to show that they are asking or soliciting the public for funds. So while although they want people to think that they're operating a foundation, and in order to qualify as a public charity in which they are with that tax code, 
that would mean that they would be receiving, if not from the public, then at least up to 33.5% of the money coming from the U.S. government, a.k.a. the American taxpayers, as I have suspected this whole entire time was happening based off of the projects and the alignment that Meghan and Harry have with the Biden regime. Now, let me continue reading on what Lady C had to say. She writes, there is also the issue of a foreign prince interfering with the implementation of the constitutional rights of American citizens. A cousin of Harry's asked me, didn't the Americans fight to prevent British royals from telling them how to lead their lives? How is it that no one's commenting on his blatant interference with the U.S. Constitution? You don't say, hmm, what have I been echoing now for the last two years going on three years about Harry and Meghan undermining the U.S. Constitution and why he needs to be deported ASAP? I'm ever so grateful that Lady C recognizes it and made it a point to put it in this book. It continues to say, indeed, Harry's activities run dangerously close to those of an undeclared foreign agent and could even be justifiably said to be tantamount to an undeclared foreign agent's activities. Irrefutably, he is a representative of a foreign power. He is a counselor of state of the United Kingdom. This gives him a legal role in the structure of a foreign state. He has not been authorized by the United Kingdom government to function as its representative. Yet, he seeks to tamper and interfere with the functioning of the United States Constitution. His activities in trying to mold the media in the U.S. is confirmed by Harry's appointment to the Aspen Institute. He is one of the 15 commissioners who have been empowered to declare what is and is not misinformation globally. This interlocks with his ongoing battle against the UK press. When his comment about freedom of the press being bonkers is taken into account, it presents an altogether unacceptable and ominous position which has only been allowed to flourish because the media and the world have been slow to recognize the danger that his activities present to our freedoms. In conclusion, it is useful to note what the Archwell Foundation, <coughs> public charity, declares as its actual aims. It is far from being either a charitable or a philanthropic organization. It is actually a political activist entity whose real purpose is to reshape the means of communication throughout the entire world by imposing restrictions it deems desirable. It seeks to limit freedom of speech, interfere with citizens' right to communicate without undue control from overseeing bodies, to limit the civil liberties of the populace, and to impose its own vision of the way things should be upon people who, at present, have the right, freedom, and liberty of differing visions. Now, I consider Lady C a credible source, and I feel validated that Lady C had published and emphasized this fact of Harry and Meghan, particularly Harry, interfering with our constitutional rights. Now, when she talks about Harry potentially being a foreign agent, well, I think it goes beyond that. I think Harry had been acting on behalf of the state because if funds from the U.S. government were given to produce that Aspen report, then that means Harry was acting on behalf of the state. And if he was acting on behalf of the state and trying to censor Americans by all the nefarious things that they have been doing in the background with these bots, and as Lady C had pointed out, Harry is counselor of state, in which in the U.S. eyes, we see him as an official from the U.K. government. So if he has been over here in the United States undermining our Constitution, then that opens up Pandora's box for even more investigation and scrutiny. And I struggle to understand why the Heritage Foundation did not raise this in the visa case, because it's not just about treating the elites differently than any other regular person like you or I. This is about defending our Constitution. And I think it is the right of the American people to know what Harry's visa says, because if he was over here on a diplomat visa, then that puts the UK in an uncomfortable position. So now when we look back and we see the actions of Barack Obama going to 10 Downing Street to talk to Rishi Sunak unofficially about what? Was it about this visa situation? As I had mentioned before, 
And in this video about election interference and Barack's involvement behind the scenes with creating and getting the censorship industrial complex up and running, I think it's really important that we start connecting those other dots and start questioning it. And I think more people outside our little royal bubble should start looking at it because we all have a responsibility, especially if you're in the United States, to defend your freedoms and rights because we see it slowly being taken away. Look at what just happened in Scotland. I am deeply alarmed that the Scottish government passed this law in the first place. J.K. Rowling rightly noted on X that the law gives the government the power to arrest people who refuse to call even male rapists and murderers women, or she and her if that's what those men demand. The Hate Crime and Public Order Act of 2021 creates a new crime for, quote, stirring up hatred, including related to trans identity. People can even be arrested for things they say in the privacy of their own home. You can be arrested for being simply insulting. Prosecutors need only prove your stirring up of hatred was likely, not even intended. Now you might think that this has nothing to do with you. You don't live in Scotland, you may not even live in Europe. But it has everything to do with you. What you say online could be held as criminal hate speech in Scotland simply by fact of somebody there reading it. And it's not just Scotland. In the U.S., pro-censorship forces hope a Supreme Court victory will let them once again ramp up censorship demands by the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. EU officials are putting in place a sweeping online censorship system that far exceeds in power and scope anything attempted under communism or fascism. And last week, European political leaders weaponized their intelligence and security agencies in order to smear everyone from German farmers to conservative politicians as supposedly Russia-linked. And yet the United States and EU governments pump far more money than Russia does into non-governmental organizations like the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, the Aspen Institute, and the Atlantic Council to wage influence campaigns aimed at smearing ordinary farmers and truckers as Russia-linked or far-right while influencing European elections. To understand how ridiculous and totalitarian the EU's focus on foreign manipulation is, Consider the fact that during the Cold War, the U.S. government's Central Intelligence Agency not only allowed Americans to read Soviet newspapers, but actually translated them into English and sent them to thousands of libraries across the United States. Just think about it. Do Europeans really need Russians or Russian-linked individuals or individuals echoing Moscow to be angry about high energy prices and uncontrolled immigration? The entire russia influence narrative coming from European politicians and intelligence agencies rests upon this monstrous insult that Europeans would be compliant were it not for Russians sowing discontent. This is an old political trick. Characterize your enemies as foreigners. It's also a trick of totalitarians. So what's driving all this? Well, part of it is that EU politicians are trying to influence the June elections by demonizing their political opponents as puppets of Russia. But another part of it appears to be driven by genuine hatred. Just listen to Scotland First Minister Yusuf Humza condemning the Scottish government on racial terms. The Lord President, white. The Lord Justice Clark, white. Every High Court judge, white. The Lord Advocate, white. Humza suggests that the reason for all this is because Scottish people are racists. But the real reason is that 95% of Scottish people are white. The fact that Humza, a non-white Muslim, is the highest ranking Scottish politician is a sign of how non-racist the Scottish people are. For Humza to reach the top political job in Scotland and then insist that the reason he's so rare is because the Scottish people are racist is itself hateful. The bad news is that the censors are on the offensive and we're on the defensive. In the US, Europe, Scotland, Germany, Ireland, Canada, Brazil, an alliance of government agencies, government-funded think tanks, and corporate news media have come together to demand ever more censorship, whether through laws like the one just enacted in Scotland or through executive actions by agencies like the US Department of Homeland Security and the FBI. The good news is we're starting to find our footing. We've been proud to publish a series of investigative pieces which have uncovered government disinformation and censorship initiatives in Germany, Ireland, and Brazil. Those investigations reveal the exact same cast of characters worldwide, including the Czech Republic, the EU, Canada, and other parts of the world, by intelligence and security agencies, the news media, and NGOs, which happen to be heavily funded by governments. As importantly, we can expose the hatred behind the hate speech policies, continue to point out that the solution to hate speech is free speech, not censorship. 
The way to counter hate is to do what Daryl Davis did, which was persuade KKK members to see him as a human being and to give up their white robes. After it's over, Daryl Davis hangs around backstage with his friend, clan wizard Roger Kelly. It's not unusual for blacks and whites to be friends, but it is unusual to find a black man and a clan leader chatting pleasantly over an orange soda after a clan rally. Davis will be the first to tell you that he could not have done his work with censorship, only with freedom of speech. There's still a lot we need to do. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of people here in the United States that have been asleep while all of this has been going on. And they have been consumed by mainstream media positioning certain narratives and lying, essentially. Fruruslev writes, this was a comment under my video about the election interference. They write, the only serious election interference you should be concerned about is the interference that the four-time indicted Donald Trump keeps instigating and directing. I'm not going to defend Prince Harry, but he is British. And though he doesn't like the British press, the freedom of speech is more limited in the UK, and he wants that for the United States as well. You're making a mountain out of a mole, I think meant molehill, and you make it sound like he wants to shut you all up. That's not what he wants. He just wants to limit your freedom of speech to the same level as in his native country, the UK. Making him worse than he is is nothing more than a conspiracy theory meant to stir the pot of political division in the U.S. Now, for Rislev, you know, your opinion is respected, hence the reason why I didn't delete it. Otherwise, I'd be just as bad as those censoring and wanting to suppress speech. But I thought it would be worth highlighting showing the ignorance of a lot of people out there who are brainwashed by the mainstream media as well as our institutions. Thankfully, though, I don't have too many of these ignorant fools that come onto this channel to tell me that I'm talking about conspiracy theories. I want to highlight this one from the election interference video in which L. Weiss TTU says, Most of the conspiracies leading up to the 2020 election have turned out to be true. Yes, that is correct. It is a known fact that a certain laptop, meaning Hunter Biden's laptop, was withheld from the general public, which is true, in which the Aspen Institute was responsible for holding that tabletop exercise and playing out the scenario of what all the media outlets should be saying should something like that happen. Wink, wink. Anyhow, there are many other examples of this. I encourage any American to stop watching and reading the mainstream media. A current example of information not being told to the general public is what is going on at the Texas border with Mexico. As a native Texan who once worked for a major law enforcement agency in Texas, I can assure you the border has not been closed for almost four years. Anything to the contrary is false. This type of thing is the result of people interfering with the election process in the U.S. Now, you may be asking yourself, why am I talking about this again? Well, the reason why is because what Harry and Meghan had been doing, along with the censorship industrial complex, is a very serious thing. And we're getting ready to see it happen all over again. I want to talk about Meghan and her bots for a second. Now, we all know that we went through a lot of pain over the last couple of years with Meghan and the Sussex squad. And Teresa Longo fans, a.k.a. Barkjack, had been front row to this experience. And I'd like to read to you what they wrote on their blog during the time that their account was deplatformed. Now, when Barkjack got deplatformed, they did a social network analysis, same kind of thing that I did to show you Ian Sexton's bot network, as well as the hashtag that was going against Catherine. They write here that their findings were hundreds, yes, hundreds of Twitter accounts are giving the impression of Sussex support and fandom. The support hive is a ruse and in no way accurate. The sheer volume of accounts is in turn used to promote favorable partners when mutually beneficial. Time, people, hello magazine probably. Many of you are right to suspect their attack dogs and squad leaders are well-placed representatives. The rest are not individual people, rather an entire cache of pro-Sussex Twitter fans manipulated by a small handful of people who seek to benefit from the fray. In a follow-up post dated March 2022, 
Teresa Longo fans, aka Barkjack, writes, Twitter accounts in general are analyzed based on a spam scoring system. Accounts more likely to be considered spam could have low follower count, long numbers in a name, brand new accounts, and accounts without profile photos. In fact, we identified a great number of these accounts to belong to a small handful of IPs, indicating several accounts are run by a few people in the Sussex squad. We have reported extensively on this after analyzing the network ourselves forensically. Technical evidence shows a huge network of hundreds of accounts run by a handful of people. While the origin of the IP is difficult to pin down, Many of these accounts are safely assumed to be employed by their PR team. How do we deduce that? It's a popular PR tactic for celebrities in the social media age, and this is not new or revolutionary. Typically, PR companies are armed with handfuls of social media accounts to drum up support, recognition, retweets, or whatever attention is sought. It is normal, but what is not normal about this situation is the sheer volume of propaganda being churned out in false support of the pair. Sometimes, real businesses maintain small Twitter accounts and legitimately start out with low follower count. This does not mean all accounts with low follower account or without human pictures in the profiles are all considered spam. Many real businesses who were identified in our social network were erroneously classified as spam just by misfortune of having relatively new accounts with not more than a few hundred followers and products for the profile photo. Their websites and online stores confirm they are real, legitimate businesses. Unfortunately, due to the spam classification system and being a part of our close network, they were also permanently banned. Yes, literally for no reason at all other than we interacted with them a lot. And we are at times rightfully critical of the behaviors of Harry and Meghan. Now, the reason why I wanted to point this out so you can understand what happened to Barkjack as they explain how this all works is so now you can understand what has been going on with our election system as well as other elections that are going on at this moment. So today, Michael Schellenberger wrote this article with the title, Government-Funded NGOs Linked to NATO Are Interfering in European Elections. Corrective and Institute for Strategic Dialogue are military and intelligent front groups spreading disinformation about German farmers and politicians, evidence suggests. Now, does the organization Institute for Strategic Dialogue ring a bell to you? It should, if you've been watching my videos, going back to the censorship industrial complex. If you notice, the Institute of Strategic Dialogue, Jory Craig, who Archwell paid her $120,000 for programmatic strategic support in order to produce a report that targeted youth on the effects of social media on mental health in order to push policy and regulation. Now, is this all starting to make sense to you? Now, I'm guessing that that report that was cranked out was paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. Now, let's go back to the article that Michael Schellenberger wrote. Please, I beg you, stick with me. I know this is a long video, but it will all come full circle in a minute. So Michael Schellenberger writes, last week, public reported that European politicians are waging a disinformation campaign aimed at smearing their political opponents as linked to Russia. The current effort appears related to a disinformation operation by the French military. In February, French military officials claimed that websites were promoting anti-French narrative. In February and now, Western government officials made accusations against their political enemies, but made no arrests and announced no prosecutions, which likely means they do not have any evidence of criminal activity. As such, government, military, and intelligence agencies are engaged in essentially political activities unrelated to national security and thus illegal. Now, public has learned that both NATO funded and government funded NGOs are working with government bodies to interfere in German elections. Their influence operation aims to keep Germany in line with American foreign policy objectives and undermine the European peace movement. 
The evidence suggests that European intelligence agencies and NATO are breaking domestic EU laws against foreign election interference. The EU prohibits elected officials and politicians from using military intelligence and security agencies to advance political and electoral means. In January, Public reported that both the German government and a slew of NGOs linked to American national security interests, like Pierre Omidar and George Soros philanthropic foundations, had funded a disinformation campaign through a fake fact-checking website called Corrective, which smeared protesting German farmers as far-right and somehow linked to Russia. In truth, the farmers were protesting high energy prices and Corrective produced no evidence of any Russian links. Now, I'm sure two names rung a bell, Pierre Omidar and George Soros, as Meghan and Harry have been aligned with the Omidar Network, with that responsible youth fund that they have collaborated together with, as well as the Open Society Foundation, the one that George Soros is a part of. But now let's talk about the organization that Jory Craig is a part of, which is the Institute for Strategic Dialogue, the ISD. Michael Schellenberger writes, Here is where NATO fronts like the Institute for Strategic Dialogue come in. The think tank recently published a report by their authors Paula Matlock and Sarah Munson, which claim that German farmers have a potential for spontaneous mobilization and a breeding ground for far-right ideology. The authors claim that the flag of a 1920s proto-fascist farmers associate was spotted at some of the recent rallies, but they add that many protesters may be unaware of the dangerous context of the narratives and symbolism used. However, they also insist that those who knowingly or unknowingly use such symbols are in doing so reproducing signifiers of anti-democratic and nationalist sentiments. Other evidence cited by Matlock and Bunsen, they quote an activist who attacked the goals of Agenda 2030, the Club of Rome, the World Economic Forum, the IPCC, and NGOs at an event organized by a farmers group. In other words, criticism of state and intelligence-linked organizations is by definition far right, according to the ISD. In reality, ISD, like Corrective, is simply spreading disinformation aimed at influencing German politics. The ISD has sought to create a house of mirrors about disinformation. It recently smeared critics of Corrective as pro-Russian and far-right actors. Ironically, ISD claimed it was disinformation to say that the protests against the German far-right were orchestrated by the state. In fact, it is clear that the German state did have a heavy hand in riling up the mass protests. Sounds familiar, right? Go back to J6 at the Capitol, and what do we find out a couple years later? That there were FBI informants in the crowd, as well as another type of hate group seen right here that was filming this whole setup, if you want to call it that. Now, I want to remind everyone once again that Harry participated in an interview with Wired, to which Rene DeResta was a participant, as well as Rashad Robinson, to talk about mis- and disinformation and the humanitarian crisis that we are facing, at which Harry so boldly states that he knew about what was going to happen on January 6th, and he tried to warn Jack Dorsey. To this day, Congress has yet to bring in Harry to question him about how did he know, especially at that time, he had declared that he wasn't on social media. Him and his wife chose not to look at it. So how would he have known that that was going on unless, unless, as we are now talking about it, the bot army that Harry and Meghan had put together sowing discourse and divisiveness and causing trouble for the institution? Who's to say that the very same thing wasn't happening to incite and stir up January 6th to happen? Harry was aligned with all the right people who had the capability to do so and have experience in doing certain things like this, because we all witnessed it firsthand with the Sussex Squad. Now, I almost wonder, all these bots and these Sussex Squad members who have been inciting hatred and violence were trying to rile people up almost to get them to storm now Buckingham Palace. They witnessed what happened at the Capitol, 
I almost wonder if they were trying to get the same effect with what they had been doing to the royal family. Now, if you've been around for a while, at least to when Sunshine Sachs had been running the show, Sanju Pun was a bot that showed up like a bad rash, as Megan Smole would say. Sanju Pun had thousands of accounts and for the most part were pretty vile. Now, I have collected a lot of Sanju Pun's tweets, but I can't put them up because most likely it will get this video restricted because they are so vile. But for the most part, what this bot used to do, it used to go and attack anyone who said certain things about Megan or put certain hashtags. And it would also retweet. It would retweet these core squatties, whatever garbage that they would put out, in addition to the left-wing media. So anything that Megan would put out concerning People magazine or anything that was negative about the royal family, these bots would be the one to amplify it. But also what's interesting, if you can find other Sanju Pun history and their bots, if you get to maybe the beginning of where these bots started from, what you'll notice is that it switches off of Meghan Markle from time to time and focuses onto the Hunter Biden laptop. So what do you think really is going on here? And here is, you know, just me speculating. But when you look at all the people that Meghan and Harry aligned with, as well as their behaviors and how they created so much division online and stoking fires and gaslighting people, wanting to incite them to cause violence. And now you have them associated with some of these bots, which I am sure had been repurposed to do other inciting, which is why I'm saying we're, we have an election coming up. And no doubt when they talk about these Russian bots coming out in full force, you know, I have a sneaking suspicion that it's the very same people who want that narrative told are the ones behind it. And we have seen this behavior all too well by the very same people that support Meghan and Harry, like Sarah Data, like Boozy, like Ian Sexton, like Pagan Chalani, like the Sussex Squad podcast, and so many more. But what's interesting, as you're looking through these tweets early on, this bot account clearly was focused on paying attention to this election and where it was going and retweeting certain tweets of certain people like Charlie Kirk, Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump Jr. And then after the election, when Biden won, it stopped. But the bots continued to focus on Meghan as well as continue to attack the royal family. No longer was it retweeting anything by Rudy Giuliani or Charlie Kirk or anything by Don Trump Jr. or anything about the election afterwards since the Biden regime had got into office. So do I think that they are connected? Yes, I do think that they were monitoring what was being said about this Hunter Biden laptop. And whatever accounts that they had to go after to silence and suppress, it would either trigger maybe some of these bots to go off and to attack some of these conservatives. But absolutely, I believe that it is related. Unfortunately, Sanju Bun has been pulled down, so it'd be hard to find other examples. But this is just an example of showing the odd one and two of topics that had been purposely suppressed and tied and connected to Meghan and Harry. So you can put two and two together and it should equal four, but we know that Boozy and gang will tell you that it's five. This is how the Democrats run and this is how they have cheated. They've been cheating us for years now. And I think it's time for all of us to wake the F up because what Meghan and Harry have done since they've been here has been so damaging to this country as we are watching the complete destruction and they played a part of it. Hence the reason why I find it so important to speak out about this particular topic, because what we are seeing right now are the same narratives that are starting to creep back up the closer we get to the U.S. election. So we're going to hear more of Russia, 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 China, 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 all trying to hack our elections and sow discourse as well as misinformation, when in reality, it could be very well the same people who did it the last time around, <coughs> aka Meghan and Harry and the likes of this whole censorship industrial complex who had played a hand in 
ultimately dictating the election towards the way that they wanted, which we are now fully seeing happened. Now I'm going to speculate if the Duke and Duchess decide to interfere again in this election cycle, we should start seeing their activity ramp up maybe towards July timeframe. So, you know, I will put my bet that we will start to see if they plan on inserting themselves, which we know Megan is not going to be able to resist somehow in order to support the Biden regime. And that's because Megan most likely doesn't want to see the end of receiving American taxpayer money for the BS social impact projects that the Biden administration throws away money at. Don't be surprised if Megan aligns with an organization that will help illegal migrants be able to vote without identification. Yes, folks, the Democrats are really pushing to allow illegal migrants to vote in our election and really pushing back on having voter ID because they feel that it's so racist to do that. You know Megan will be first on that bandwagon because she loves to use that race card and make up some stupid story of how she couldn't vote for some reason because she didn't have ID. You know, there's a lie in there somewhere. There's a lot more that I could say about this, especially around the bots and the people that are involved with it. But for the time being, I'm just going to pause. There's a lot more that I could say about this, especially around the bots and the people that are involved with it. But for the time being, I'm just going to pause because I still do feel that more people have to wake up to understand what this couple has been doing. And, you know, it really is important that the public knows what kind of visa Harry came here with, because I've explained why it matters. You know, like, it's not just him coming over here and doing drugs. It's a lot more than that. It is defending our Constitution and our civil rights. And we have a domestic threat here who is undermining that. And I think at all costs, I think people need to be concerned about that and demand that DHS release his immigration records just to know what type of visa he came over here with and how he got in here, especially if he did lie on his application. You know, I do think that the reason why there is so much secrecy around it and DHS stomping their feet is because of what I outlined before and Harry and Meghan's involvement with the Biden regime. But all of you guys can call me conspiracy theorists. You know, I'm used to it. But everything that I have been saying for the last two years is now starting to trickle out and you're seeing it in full form. Meantime, here we are suffering through, you know, a lot of nonsense that could have been prevented, quite frankly. And I'm sorry, but I don't want to go another four years dealing with this, this garbage because it will be over. You know, we will lose everything. But enough of that. What do you guys think? Definitely leave your thoughts below. As always, I will be back with more content. But until then, please be safe and I will talk to you later. Bye. Oh, yeah. Such a broad. <laughs>